We're into Isaiah, please, and chapter 45. I'm going back on 45 for one verse. Isaiah 45 and verse number 11. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and His Maker, Ask of me things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the work of my hands command ye me. I've made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their host have I commanded. Now, I just don't want us to miss the teaching of this little verse before we leave the 45th chapter, having dealt with most of it in detail last week. I want you to notice two words that occur in verse 11. God says to his people, I want you to ask of me. And then he says, in the very same breath, he says, I want you to command me. I don't only want you to ask me for things. I want you to command me for things. So I'm going to speak a short word to you at the beginning of this study. And if you're watching by video, go get your Bible with your cup of coffee or whatever, or your polo mints, and read the verse, folks, because it's a fabulous verse. Ask of me and command of me. Asking and commanding. The Lord Jesus said that his people were to go into the secret place, to shut to their door, and pray to their Father which was in secret. And their Father which seeth in secret would reward them openly. Now, the word in that great message in the Sermon on the Mount for the secret place, that place where you can go in your life and get away from everybody and be alone with God, is called in the Greek language the temaion. And if you go to Greece on your holidays and go into a restaurant, I've never been there, but they tell me it is so, and go to pay your bill after you have eaten your meal, the man will sit in a little kiosk or whatever, and the name over him will say, Temayon. He is the treasurer. He is the man who takes the treasure. He is the cashier. He is the man who is looking after the money, or in the original Greek, the treasure. Jesus said, go into the temaion, the treasure house. Shut the door and pray to your Father in secret. And prayer is the key that unlocks the treasure of the promises of God. I got a letter from one of you recently pleading with me to explain prayer, the dynamics of prayer, what is behind prayer? What does it mean? Well, from this passage, when God says to his people, ask and command, there is no doubt, as your notes tell you, that prayer is cooperation with God. Now, I'm sorry there is a little mistake in your note sheet. 15 in brackets after the word treasure should read I-S. It means Isaiah 
45 and 11. Then point two, Isaiah 46, 1 and 2. Point three, Isaiah 46, 3 and 4. And Isaiah 45 and 11 is saying that prayer is a necessary link in God performing his promises in your life. Do you know why a whole lot of us haven't got things from God? Do you know why? Because we never ask for them. Now just settle down, everybody, and be quiet. You're very noisy. Just listen carefully. It's a hot night, and the devil's been chasing me all day. And this could be a very rough ride. I've had one of the most depressing days of my life today. So give me your attention. Four, four square. Because the devil will wreck this meeting as sure as daylight if you don't pray me through it. I settle down. The point is that not only is God saying to us, ask. He is saying to us, command. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you notice in chapter 44 and chapter 45, line after line after line of the teaching through God's servant is the word, I will. I will. I will. I will. And God is saying, now I can do it. I have the power to do it. I have the facilities to do it. But you must understand that prayer is the key that unlocks it. It's not a very popular subject, prayer, because it is such a battle to get into prayer. But James says, we have not because we ask not. You think of your breakfast table in the morning. Think of all that's on it. You know that when you look at your breakfast table and you start eating from your breakfast table and everything that's there, the loaf, the flour that made it, the sun that grew the wheat and so on, or helped to grow it. As you look upon all of that, that's God's promise being fulfilled, seed time and harvest. But the harvest would be no good unless you went out or somebody went out and cooperated with God and brought it in. You take, for example, the jewel, say, in a South African diamond mine. No use in there if men do not dig into that earth and get it out. The coal that warms us throughout the winter time or whatever, no use unless men cooperate with God's work to bring it to us. There's no part of our daily life which isn't a cooperation between God and man. And prayer is part of that system that God uses. I will dry up thy rivers. I will go before thee and make crooked places straight, verse 2. I will break in pieces the gates of brass, verse 2. Verse 3, I will give thee the treasures of darkness. I will, I will, I will. But God says, don't forget, you've got to ask as well. So prayer is a great mystery. But it is a cooperation between God and us. I think also that prayer unlocks the treasure for God to bring 
his best blessings to those who persist in prayer. You see, and this is absolutely true, if there is no humility in me and no submission in me and no cutting my soul away from the system of this world, which is anti-Christ and anti-God, and separating myself to live for the Lord in this godless generation. If there's none of that in me, and God blessed me with great blessings, then instead of helping me, they would injure me. I would get proud and lift it up and think I was somebody when I am nothing. And there are a whole lot of people, even Christians, who if they would, and this applies to me too, humble themselves before God and submit to God and to His Word. That God would open the windows of heaven and pour them out blessings they've never dreamt of. There is no doubt about it that God in His dear love withholds His choicest gifts until we are humbled. Don't misunderstand me. But the people that God has blessed most in spiritual work are people who know what it is to have their hearts broken. And a great man of God once said, it seems to me that God never uses a man or a woman until their heart has been broken. It is those who are of a humble, contrite spirit that God blesses. Now, that's not the kind of thing that's presented on television in the fast lane of the consumer age but it is the way to spiritual blessing. I know, I know that I look into some faces tonight, and I know some of you very well. You have been feeding here in this class for many a long day. And I know some of you are going through the darkest moments of your life this week. And you don't come here as coming to any picnic. You come here as coming to a feast, a spiritual feast. You're hungry. Heartbroken one. Lonely one. Hurting one. You are the person that God can use. You say, me, you. Because when a heart is broken, you have to cry to the Lord for help. You say, vain is the help of man. And in your extremity, you discover that a computer can do nothing for you, that a university degree, very useful as it is, cannot solve your problem, that your teachers, that the, that, that, that the novelists, that the films around you, that, that all the rest of it, they cannot meet your need at its deepest level, and you maybe recently in a heartbreaking situation have been crying.
crying to God for help, it'll come. It'll come. That cry is a real healthy sound as far as soul health is concerned. And like the sneeze of that wee boy when Elijah, when Elijah was used by God and stretched himself upon him, it indicated that returning life to that child. So your cries to God are indicative of a spiritual blessing that's going to come. You'll never reach that majestic flight of the eagle. Or you'll never plumb the, plumb the, uh, you'll never reach the, the heights of the majestic flight of the eagle until, in a sense, you have plumbed the depths of what it is to have to trust God and God alone. A lot of boys don't need God. At least they think they don't. And they can go on for months and weeks and years, and they never talk about them. They are self-sufficient, and we know their end. But you've trusted the Lord, and you've gone through sore trial for it, and you wonder what's happening. Maybe just like our friend who lost her two babies. What is wrong, Lord? Why do others have blessing and I don't? Like these people held in in the city of Babylon behind three brick walls for 70 years, and they think we're never, ever going to get out of this. God says, you'll get out. I will, I will make a crooked way straight. I will bring you out. But ask of me. Notice that verse 11 says, Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his Maker. His Maker is saying, Ask of me things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the work of my hands. Command ye me. So that prayer in essence is openness to God, an open hand, an open heart, turning to God and to God alone in the extremity of your situation, standing upon his promises, crying to heaven to drop down God's blessings. And your heart and your hand and your mouth and your life is open and say, Lord, all I have is you. Ah, but he is enough. But notice, notice that it has an imperative accent. Not only does God say, I will, I will, I will, I will, but you are to take that key of prayer and unlock the on and get in there and get those treasures from me by asking. It is a great mystery, but it's true. Prayer brings down blessing. Prayer opens the way. Prayer moves the heart that moves the world. But in a sense, prayer is not me asking God to move my way. It is coming before God with my supplications and prayers and requests, asking him to move me his way. And then comes the blessing, because prayer is that openness to God that's saying, Lord, what do you want? And Lord, I'm laying this before you. That's the secret. But uh, it's amazing how few avail themselves of it. Prayer meetings can be the most boring places on the face of the earth. Why is it? So sparsely attended, so hard, so difficult. What's wrong? Well, there are a whole lot of things wrong. But it seems that we haven't yet any idea. We're only beginning to learn that if only we took prayer seriously and only we, we applied prayer to every situation we're in, and you don't have to spend hours on your knees to do this, 
This can be anywhere, in any situation. That secret place, in a sense, can be in a busy office. When in your heart, you shut out your mind and heart for a moment to everything going around you and cry to the Lord. Nehemiah prayed right there, a telegram prayer between two sentences as he was talking to the king. And God answered him and opened up mighty things for him. But the devil doesn't want us to see the treasure that's available. The devil doesn't want us to see that prayer is the key. So we don't pray and we don't ask, and we miss getting the treasure we could get. I find this difficult to explain, but command ye me. What does that mean? Well, you remember when the Lord was here on earth, when entering Jericho, he stood still and he said to the blind beggars, what will ye that I should do unto you? What do you want me to do for you? It was as though he was saying to them, I am yours to command. Do you remember that Zarephanician woman who kept coming and coming and coming to the Lord with her requests? He yielded. He yielded the key of his resources to that woman as she kept coming, and he told her to help herself eventually. And do you remember those apostles in the New Testament? They caught the spirit of what the Lord was trying to teach whenever they came out, and they started to pray, and their spirit-inspired prayers began to, to have this tone of command in them. And now, Lord, they said, look upon their threatenings and grant unto thy servant to speak thy word with all boldness. See that? Commanding of God. It's not cheek. It is saying, Lord, here are your resources. Here are your promises. Do it. So yield yourself to God, my friend. And whatever he says to you, do it. And do it immediately. Don't hold back. And let God have his way with you. And God will be able to trust you and to give you his key and to bid you help yourself to spiritual blessings according to his will. I mean, you've only got to read the life of George Miller to see this applied. Going up the Hudson River in the middle of a terrible mist and the captain in despair, Miller says, just remove that mist, Lord, and it's gone. These men and women, you know, like my mother who got down one night when I was a little boy and said, Lord, take all this snow away for a wedding tomorrow that I'm going to. Oh, I didn't like my mother's prayers because they got answered almost on the spot at times. There was not a speck of snow in the morning. You say, do you really mean that? Oh, my friend, if you had faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you could say to that mountain, be removed. And it would be. Mountains in your way of all kinds of things. But because it's a battle and the devil has it surrounded with, ah, well, now, this, that, and the other, and you turn to other things and you, you, you think about other things and a whole lot of you seek the Ouija board maybe and you seek the astrologer, you go to the gypsy, you... You, you talk to clever people, you read books, and if only you'd leave the whole thing aside and go in there and fall on your knees before God. I am saying it, and I am saying it with all of my heart. Prayer is the key that unlocks the treasure to the promises of God. And I'm talking to believers now. How many believers are turning to these other things that would amaze you. They are disillusioned maybe with the professing church and, and the devil blinds them and they leave the place of prayer and their lives get into a mess. If you're not a believer tonight, then I would say to you, call upon the name of the Lord where you're sitting. Repent of your sin and put your trust in the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Your sins will be forgiven and you will be set free, and then you will begin to pray 
as a believer should pray. Now, I hope you'll never forget those points, nor that I will never forget them. We cooperate with God. It brings his best blessings. It is an openness towards God, and it has an imperative accent. You say, but I have been praying for years, and the Lord hasn't answered. My friend, your prayer will be answered. You just keep at the praying. You just be like that Syrophoenician woman. You just keep coming before him again and again and again, pouring it out before him, pouring it out before him. And one day it'll appear as the finger of a man's, man's hand almost, or a man's hand in the sky, and then the sky will darken, and then the rains will fall. I remember one night I was in a situation in my life in despair as a young fellow. I was driving the car along. I was doing something in my life that was totally wrong, and I knew it was wrong. And I remember stopping by an old farm gate at the side of the road, and I stopped the car, and I looked up to the heavens, and I said, Lord, I'll cut it out of my life, I promise you. Away with it. No more. I'm wrong, and I repent. And Lord, my heart is breaking, and it's going to be the hardest thing I've ever had to give up, but give it up I will by your grace. And I don't know how it's going to go with me. And I don't know how it's going to fare. But Lord, Lord, help me. Oh, my friend, it was hard for a wee while. But then came the answer. And I'm here tonight by the grace of God alone, teaching you, and I don't deserve to. Some fella looking into my face just now. I love you, fella, for Jesus' sake. I'm glad to see you here. And maybe you've left talking to your Lord and you've pulled away from the treasure house. And you'd rather have company with other things and other people than your Lord's company. Oh, the blessedness you knew when first you knew the Lord. And God says, there's the key. Go in there and open up my promises, and I'll fulfill them to you. No, Lord. No. I'd rather go my own way. Well, if you do, you'll be the loser. Maybe some girl here tonight that God is speaking to. And before long, you'll not only be asking God according to his promises, reverently speaking, you will, according to his will, be commanding him to bring down the blessing. And he'll do it in Ulster, in our day. If he could do it for these people, surrounded with terrorism, he can do it for us. It's a great promise. Well, of course, it happened, and their prayers were answered. Cyrus was brought all the way from, from Iran and from Africa to the Aegean. He conquered until he stood at the gates of Babylon, diverted the rivers of the water, went up the Uzi Channel, Darius did, and then underneath and into the city and took the city. And boy, those fellows raked across that city. They burned, they pillaged, they killed. And that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And we know that Daniel told them about God's prophecies. And they were repatriated, the whole job, a lot of them eventually, out of that city and that two-leaf gate that never seemed to, was never going to open again for them, opened, and back they went to the land. But says God, ah, but says God, I want to show you something. Idols are not into burden-bearing because... In chapter 46, verse 1, the soldiers came in and they grabbed one of the great gods called Bel. Bel boweth down. Nebo stoopeth. Their idols were upon the beasts and upon the cattle, and your carriages were heavy loaden, and they are a burden to the weary beast. <clears throat> they stoop, 
They bow down together. They could not deliver the burden, but themselves are gone into captivity. What an absolutely fantastic scene this is. It's a fabulous scene. This is an incident from the fall of Babylon. And the soldiers, after they had taken this city, now grab these mighty giant of an idol, Bel and Nebo. And what do they do with it? They take them and they chuck them or throw them into the back of a carriage or a wagon. And the beast is put into the carriage and away, or, or to, to draw the carriage away, and the heavy, heavy, heavy idol is a burden, says Isaiah in verse 1, to the weary beast. The old beast that's drawing it along is absolutely weary because it's very heavy. And the very gods that that whole city and nation had bowed down to are now themselves taken into captivity because the soldiers take them away. And they ignominiously pull them down from their pedestals. And they have no respect with their rude hands for these idols except maybe to take any of the jewels that were on them and put them in their pockets. And the great God of eternity says, Look at what's happening, everybody. The idols that they worshipped while you were in captivity through your prayers and my promises have now been taken into captivity themselves. I tell you, friends, in days of plague and in days of sickness, those huge idols were carried up the streets by the people and the priests of the people through the streets of Babylon, and they thought that these gods could take away their plague and could take away their sicknesses. I tell you, things have altered now. There's no pomp. There's no ceremony. They're ripped down. They're thrown into the back of the carriage. They're taken away into captivity. Now, says God, I want to talk to you, my people, and I want to give you a promise. Listen to me, my people. And here is a message for those of you who know the Lord this evening. Hearken unto me, verse 3, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are born by me from the belly, which are carried from the womb. And even to your old age I am he, and even to whore hairs will I carry you. I have made, and I will bear, I will carry, and will deliver you. What's this? We are invited to consider a description of God in which the opposite to these idols stands out in great relief. They didn't bear you from your birth, did they? God says, I knew you when you were in the womb. I knew all about you. And I have carried you since you were a little embryo in there, a little fetus. And I've carried you from the womb, and I've brought you to birth, and I'm going to make you a promise. Until you go down with your whore hairs into your grave, I'll carry you. I will bear. I will carry. God didn't need any courage to carry him. His everlasting arms was their cradle and their carriage. He had been, he would be, he wouldn't change. He'd carry them to old age and he would bear and he would carry and he would deliver them. It doesn't mean to say we won't take sick and die. That doesn't mean to say that maybe a bomb might not take us away. That doesn't mean to say that we may not ha have an accident in our lives and that bring about our death. No, no. 
Little sparrows have the same things happen to them. God cares for them. You're of more value than a sparrow because you're not just in this world. There is a world to come. And you may be taken out of this. And as C.S. Lewis said, war does not lessen death. We are all going to die anyway. And we're going to have to face it if the Lord be not come. Every one of us. And if we're trusting in Christ as Savior, and we know him, God in Christ, he promises that he will carry us till the river rolls its water at our feet, and he'll bear us safely over when our journey is complete. I'm not talking moonshine. I'm talking tonight in this pulpit about the promises of God. You know, some people carry their religion, and others let it carry them. Some are burdened with a whole lot of creeds and a whole lot of ritual and a whole lot of observances and a whole lot of traditions, and they commit themselves to them and how they work at them and how they strive for them. Like a little woman I met down in Tipperary, and it's a long way to Tipperary and a long way back again. Like a little woman said to me, right there in that forest, ah, she said... She said, I went along to my place of worship, and I went, and I went, and I went for 20, 30 years. And she said, I thought my, my good deeds would outweigh my bad deeds, and I'd be all right. She said, I went into a meeting one night down here, and I made a discovery. I discovered that God loved me, and I never thought God loved me. I thought he was into weighing. I didn't think he loved me. And she said, I put my trust in the Savior. And she said, these last years, she said, just these last three years have been fantastic. My friend, are you trusting in church attendance to get you to heaven, in good works to get you to heaven? If you are, my friend, they won't. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And a whole lot of dear, sincere people, they are going around and they are bearing our religion on their backs and they're working hard at it day and night trying to get salvation. And my friend, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift. Why not take it in Christ tonight? And not only will he save you, he says, I will bear, I will carry, and deliver you. I'll take you through. Ah, God comes near to bear burdens. What kind of burdens does God make himself responsible for? Well, first of all, the burden of existence. You see, you had no option to be born, did you? You didn't have anything to do with it. You didn't choose and say, well, I'm not going to be born because I don't like that father of mine that's to be or that mother of mine. No, no, I'm not going to be born. You had absolutely no choice. I had no choice in it. We must live. And the burden of existence is a very real burden. I see my little ones growing up in this land. And they didn't choose to be brought up in this land of themselves. They are brought up in my family, and they have, those little ones, the burden of existence. And so do you. And death may draw a line, my friend, bring a comma in your life, but it doesn't bring a full stop. You must live, you must exist, not only if it's not on this earth, it will be in the next. You will exist forever, for life is continuous. We don't believe what the Jehovah Witnesses teach, that if you don't have eternal life, then you go into eternal death, you're snuffed out, and that's it. The Bible doesn't teach that, which you respects to them. The plain fact of the matter is you will live the lifetime of God, and the burden of existence is very real. You say, hey, but I'm not a Christian tonight. I'm not saved. Well, my friend, you can't be saved. Because the very same word, I will bear, is the word used in chapter 53 when it says of Christ prophetically on his cross, it says, 
I have borne their griefs. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. It's the same word. Your griefs, your sorrows, all the punishment that should have been poured out on your head for your sin, Jesus bore it on the tree. And God, who knew those sins, led them on him. And if you believe it, you'll be free. That's the gospel. Bear your griefs. Bear your sorrows. Bear the punishment for your sin. That's the message of Calvary. That's the message of the cross. Have you trusted Jesus and his cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Have you come to appreciate what that blood flowed for? For you, that your sins might be forgiven. Rest there tonight, my friend. And the burden of existence, why, if I die tonight, rough and all as this world is, very rough at times, if I die tonight, <laughs> then it'll be an eternity to serve the Lord forever on the other side. And if I have another day to live, it'll be another day to live for the Master. Either way, he takes the burden of existence, and because he lives, we can face tomorrow. He makes life worth living. What about the burden of sin? Well, we've dealt with that. And Peter said, I am a sinful man, O Lord. I can't come near you, Lord. I am a sinful man. Yet the Lord bore those sins for Peter. Then, of course, some of you have responsibility for others. Your wives, your children, your mothers, your fathers. Somebody tonight got a sick mother at home? Sick father? Sick little ones? Or you have employees that depend on you? Lonely ones? tempted ones, persecuted ones around you that God has made you responsible for. I am responsible for teaching this class, and I tell you, these thousand souls weigh very heavily on my heart day and night, because I shall have to stand before the bar of God and give an account for I, how I have fed you. And have I been faithful? And have I given you God's Word, or have I just given you myself have I led you to Christ and pointed you to Christ? And those of you who know the Lord, have I, have I shown you the way from God's Word? That is my responsibility. And sometimes it becomes very heavy, and I wonder if I'll ever be able to go through with it. And then I discover, suddenly, when it is darkest, the Lord draws near and says, Look, I'm here. Just you roll your burden upon me, and he carries it. You got a responsibility for others, my friend? That wee Sunday school class of yours, that mother, that wife, those children. God will bear, He will bear those burdens for you. Take them and cast upon them upon the Lord, and He will sustain you, not only for life, but for eternity. The burden of responsibility for others. And then, of course, there's our life work. We've all been sent to do a job, and we've talents entrusted to us and a corner of God's vineyard that we're called to cultivate. And it's lonely, isn't it? I can't do your job, dear, and you can't do mine, maybe. I'm not, I don't go where you go, and you maybe don't go where I go. And God has put you into that corner, and it's like a dear man who belongs to this church, one of its most beloved members and most deeply respected members. He said to me recently, Derek, I have got troubles and problems that nobody knows about. Well, what a kind man he is. You got those burdens. The burden of that work is solitary. It can't be otherwise. Everybody has that solitariness in their life work. God calling some fella here tonight away, perhaps to India, or maybe like Clifford and Michelle that he called out from those benches down there or those pews and took them away to Africa. And Clifford, I hear, is absolutely in the thick of working as a, as a doctor right there in Africa, now up to his ears in work that he never would have known in Down Hospital. Just as a young man cast right into it, is God calling someone else? 
speaking to you tonight and stirring you about your life work and you say, hey, it's lonely as I try to find God's will. That's right, it is. But he will bear. He will bear the burden of your life work. He will bear the burden. I have found that if you cast yourself upon God and cast yourself upon God absolutely, he will care for your every need down to even providing a pair of shoes for my feet this very day. You trust him, and I'll tell you, he will provide the need. If you need the shoes, you'll get them. If you don't, you won't. He doesn't supply your greed. He supplies your need. And my God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And God never sent anybody out to do a job for him at their own charges. And you don't have to be a preacher to experience that. Many of you in business tonight could come into this pulpit and we could be here to midnight. Boy, I'd love to break out and do it and get you to witness of how God has blessed you and guided you through these years of bombing and killing and murder and mayhem and trouble and sorrow and difficulty and how God has born and how God has cared for you and delivered you and helped you with your life work. And you know, each human must bear his own burden of existence and responsibility and work. But just here, Jehovah steps in and he doesn't distinguish between my burdens and me. He lifts the pair of us and carries us. He carries me and thus carries my burdens. You say, why does God do all this? Why does God say he will bear and bring you comfort? And I tell you, he will bring you comfort. I think it was one of the Nolan sisters recently. I think she lost a baby, of the singers, and she turned to the scriptures and she said how she found in the Bible, she found in the Bible answers that she never thought she could find. How many a lonely soul out there, broken by sin and depravity and all sorts of things rich in this world's goods, have discovered in the Word of God, the answer to their deepest problems, and God has shown he can bear. Lovely story told by T. Ernest Wilson when he was here just recently about a surgeon who was, went for a walk across part of America to have a rest from his heavy, heavy work, and he got out on the road and walked for many hundreds of miles, and one day as he was walking along and doing something entirely different, he went into a little house. This man is still alive and went into a little house and knocked a door, rather, and asked the lady, could he have a cup of milk? And she went and she got him, or he asked her for a glass of water, and she went and got him out of the fridge a beautiful glass. I'm an orange man, by the way. She got a lovely, lovely glass of cool, cool milk. And he drank it, and the story is indeed that quite a few months later, having discovered that this lady, while she was talking to him, was ill and needed an operation, and in America, of course, you've got to pay for operations, and they cost thousands and thousands of dollars, this lady was brought into the hospital, and, and of course, she had her operation, and she didn't know that the surgeon that did the operation on her was the fellow who had asked for the... the uh, glass of water. And when she came to the surgeon to pay her bills, she discovered that it was the fellow who had knocked at the door, and the thousands of dollars were all totted up, and along the bottom of it said, paid for with one glass of ice-cold milk. Jesus said a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple will not go without its reward. I'm telling you, even Joe, who's so good to me, he doesn't just give me a glass of water, he gives me orange. When he's going to get a double blessing for it. And a whole lot of others of you serving here tonight on the video, on audio, stewarding and working, 
behind the scenes. You don't know the whole lot of you. The reward that lies ahead of you, you don't do it for a reward, but you're going to get it. A whole lot of you here tonight, and you're doing your life work for the Lord, and you wonder, oh, my friend, the Lord will bear your burdens, and he'll reward you beyond your wildest dreams. Why does he do it? I'll tell you why he does it. Because he made us. He made us. And because he made us, and because he created us, he then takes the responsibility of looking after us. That's the reason. I have made, says verse 4, and I will bear. That's why, because I made you. He fashioned you. And he put appetites inside you, my friend, that only he can satisfy. That no drug, that no, no nicotine, that no immorality, that no anything could satisfy. No holiday, no anything could satisfy. He created within you desires and appetites that only he can fill. And he will bear, and he will satisfy. And of course, he's placed you in circumstances of unusual difficulty. That's why he put you there. And he entrusted you with work of great importance that you never thought would come your way. And he gave you that duty to do. But because he did this, he is responsible for the accomplishment of his purposes. And although it's tough and although it's dark and you find it difficult, he must perfect that which concerneth us, since his mercy endureth forever. He can't forsake the work of his own hands. And since he made you, he will keep you and will bear. And what is the consolation of the burden bearer? Well, the consolation of all this teaching is that when you are down and in anguish about recent sins that you've committed, he tells you of Calvary that happened long before your sin was committed, in fact. Christ died on the cross, and your sins were future. And he reminds you of Calvary's blood and the victory of the cross, Christian. And this burden bearer, he bears your griefs, he bears your iniquities, he bears your sorrows. He will forgive you and cleanse you and has done so. And in your hours of anguish for recent sin, he brings this message of consolation. Oh, I talked to one recently in desperate trouble with recent sin, desperate sorrow with recent sin, and wondered about the judgment of God on their head. And I said, look, the judgment fell on Christ on the cross, and when you trusted him as your Savior, the penalty of sin was removed. You'll have the chastisement of the Lord, but the judgment of God will not fall upon you as such. You will have the Lord's chastisement, just like a father would chastise a little child. Bring it into line so God will chastise you like he did with David or whatever, or Peter. And so it is. Isn't that great consolation? He will bear. And in moments of, of great anxiety in your life, and moments of great trouble when you're worried about the future and you say, I can't do it, Lord. I can't go through. I've got these exams. I've got to face them tomorrow. I've worked and I've worked and I've slogged until I'm a walking zombie. And I can't go through. You'll go through. He will bear. Jesus knows all about your troubles. He knows all about them. Why? He made you. And an exam is just one, one thing. In a long heap of mountains, you'll have to cross in life, and he'll bear you through the whole lot of them. Believe me. In moments of great anxiety, it's great to have the burden bearer. And when you're worried about the future, well, you're having it tough, aren't you? It's better to be preserved in brine than to rot in honey. And you're having a rough sailing and going through a dark passage. 
God consoles you tonight. And here is the promise of God. And may it be written on your heart and written on your mind forever. May you never forget this service as long as you live. And if you never see me again, Christian, can I say to you from the depths of my heart as a servant of God, here is God's word to you tonight. Let me read it to you in the presence of God. Even to your whore hairs will I carry you. I have made and I will bear, even I will carry you and will deliver you. And if that's not good enough for you, friend, I don't know what is. And the people of God said, Amen. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for your help tonight in your mighty word. We thank you for this congregation, for their patience, and thank you for their love for the word of God. And Father, we pray that you'll speak mightily through your word tonight to all of our hearts. You are the God who bears burdens. And Father, we roll our burdens upon you tonight and go from this place rejoicing. And the people of God said, Amen.